of our technical um, webinar series. Today we will be talking about lubrication, tools, and the importance of data. My name is Tom Zhang, Senior Engineer at Optimus Solutions, and my buddy over here, Mike Lyons with the Eastern District. Um, we've been saying this on uh, just about every webinar now. Um, uh, please make sure you can see Mike and myself. Uh, uh, there are times where we will utilize the uh, drum um, uh, during the discussions as visual aids. Um, if you guys have any um, technical questions on um, setting things up, we do have a crew. We have a very uh, uh, experienced crew that can help you guys with any issues that you have. You guys can email um, or use the chat to try to get a hold of someone to help you guys out. Without further ado, Mike, let's go ahead and get started. Sounds good. Okay, so again, this is session four. Uh, this is, uh, if you guys miss one, two, and three, uh, we do have that available. Um, a pre, uh, not pre-recorded, but, uh, but recorded. So if you guys do miss and, and some of the references on some of the other um, uh, concepts, feel free to email us or, or check your email box. It, it should be organized and ready for you. This is a, a free training for um, that we're mimicking online for regional training. So lubrication tools and data. Okay, so just to start with lubrication, um, move this thing over here. Okay, so the items on here, the, um, the um, tire, the trunnions, the gearbox, the pinions, the support rollers, the open gear, the horizontal rollers. What do you think all these have in common with lubrication? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> uh, so basically, metal metal contact is probably the fastest uh, route to failure, or not failure, but uh, decreased life. Well, yeah, and you're, you're, failure. you're getting wear. It's metal to metal, and lubrication is a much much cheaper way. It's, it's cheaper to throw away lubrication than throw away a, a what, quarter million dollar gear right, right. gear section. So, again, lubrication is um, both an art and a science, but a lot, of, a lot of the sciences we want to focus on. Just uh, going around squirting uh, uh, grease into, into a spot and putting as much as you want on it without even thinking where it comes from is probably not the best uh, preventive maintenance practice. Right, right. So, okay, so bearing lubrication, why do we lubricate? <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, wear, friction, heat, rust, corrosion, um, and uh, cleaner transmission of power, okay? Um, there are lots of different types. So the most common in, say, pillow block bearings are grease. Um, grease is an oil, and it just happens to use uh, something else to make it thick. Grease is not a thickener, okay? Um, the thickening agents are uh, different um, structures. So you have, say, an aluminum complex, a lithium complex, um, and they all have a certain reason to be in there. And uh, the, the NLGI number is typically a kind of a rating for how thick. So if it's really thin, maybe it's something like mineral oil um, versus something really thick, or, or maybe even honey, right? Compared to something really thick, maybe like a really <laughs> almost Velveeta cheese-like. Right. Uh, so that's kind of the characteristics there. Main point here is you can't just take a grease from company A and go to company B get a grease and just put it in. Okay. It is worth asking. It's worth asking about compatibility because if uh, you put it in and it doesn't react the right way or it reacts negatively to something else, yes, you'll have damage onto your failure. Right. right. So uh, grease is grease, but grease is not grease. Right. <laughs> it's one of those vague things. It is uh, so again, grease 
has oil or it is oil and then you use something else to get it to where it's thicker and typically grease have uh, say um, relatively high viscosities to keep keep uh, life onto your bearings okay and these are um, again spherical roller bearings fill block bearing styles okay so um, Roller bearing failures, right? So if you have, uh, if you if you don't lubricate, that is uh, easily one way. Okay. If you have too much thrust or too much skew on the on on that particular bearing, or it gets too hot. So if it gets too hot, the reason why it fails is a it's hot. So um, um, the different mechanisms inside can expand, contract in in odd ways. But really, what happens is when it's hot, your lubricant loses uh, viscosity. And then you lose the protective life it has. So different types of lubricants. Um, we have uh, our RPM type of uh, uh, our, our, our internal branded RPM uh, lubricants that we can use. Uh, we do have. Uh, I'm gonna go back here. One. Um, if you guys have questions on it, if you guys would like to know more details, please feel free to contact your key account specialist on the details on that, or call Mike. <laughs> so you got you got spherical roller bearings um, for say pillow punk styles. So this is more common in rotary dryers or things that are lighter. And when I say lighter, maybe half million pounds to quarter million pound range. Sleeve bearing types are say your kiln style bearings. These are easily in the million pounds or more, and it's a different mechanism. If you guys want to know more details about, about that, that's in our last webinar that we talked about on mechanical systems that we go in detail on what a roller bearing is, what a um, sleeve bearing is. This is just talking about the lubricants. So I think last time we had a question on um, what lubricant to use. So instead of what lubricant to use, we stick with what viscosity to use. So here what you see is 40 degrees, this is uh, roughly room temp, um, or um, 100, 100 degrees, which is roughly boiling point. So for a kiln sleeve bearing style, 923 to 1500 cent of stoke range of lubricant at lower temperatures, but realistically, you're gonna be looking at the 96106 cent of stoke range, okay? The reason why is when you put it in a kiln, it's gonna be uh, not cold, but hot, right? So when you look at your lubricants, one of the most important things to look at is this range. So the comparative data on 40C to 100C or 104F to 212F, how drastically that drops from a high centistoke or high viscosity range to something low, how drastic it drops, how much it drops, or how little it drops is what we call the viscosity index. Okay, so this is something that is worth looking into. So um, there's lots of uh, asphaltic types or mineral oil based types, and there's also synthetic types. And I'm sure we'll go through it later, but just, just um, to keep that on your mind, mineral is you crack an oil, um, uh, frack, crack, whatever you want in the oil field, get something from Mother Nature, um, get it, change it into oil, sell it, right? And use it. Synthetic is you take it, it's still oil, it's still from Mother Nature, but what you do different is um, one process is they take natural gas, they take that particular size of molecule, and then they make oil out of it. So it, would it be more of an additive? So with synthetic versus um, mineral, really the difference is the size of the of the of the, of the uh, structure. So think about uh, you got a whole bunch of BBs or let's say a whole bunch of marbles. Um, when you slip on the marbles, it, it's quite fast, right? But what if you have marbles and a whole bunch of big balls and small balls? When you step on it, you may step on the big balls first because it's the highest right. and then it, it eases its way down. So the, the similarity in the, excuse me, in the size of the molecules gives it um, 
better viscosity and better strength. Right. So that's the difference between synthetic and non-synthetic. Um, again, if you guys got questions, if you want to know what, what's something you could use on the kiln sleeve bearings, let us know. We do have products that we can uh, um, help you guys with. Um, similarly, uh, with the other style, lubrication is a big failure, uh, part of the failure, overthrusting, heat, uh, radial load. So on kilns, it's even more important on heat because instead of a dryer with, what, 200 Fahrenheit shell, your kiln is maybe 800 Fahrenheit shell or higher, right? Um, this is something that periodic tests, periodically tests your oils. Okay, so kilns will tend to be oil, oils and, and roller, uh, circle rollers 10 degrees. So on this one, you want to do oil testing. Uh, we do have capabilities to help you do oil testing, and uh, we are actually uh, working on ways to take that data, trend that data, and then over time, we'll be able to see what what may be a causing failure. If you've worn into the brass, we'll see brass uh, come up or, or coppers, et cetera, come up. If you have other contaminants in there, we'll see it. So make sure to do uh, oil tests. Pretty easy to do. Pretty easy to do. Take it, squirt the oil in, and send it off to the lab. Right. Um, simple maintenance ideas. Check uh, runouts. Check um, anything that could cause wear, anything that cause um, over lubrication, so seals. Most of the time, seals will, will come out. Um, again, uh, lubricate. Make sure you follow the instructions. Make sure you have uh, certain additives for certain types. So like if it's a, if it's a kiln, it's high weight. So extreme pressure is worth noting um, you, um, on the gear also. Sampling, again, O sample. It tells you details on, on what may or may not. Um, on the gears, you got different couplers. These are worth uh, noting. Um, I think we, we, we talked about how on high-speed couplers we tend to like the um, fluid coupling, but these, these styles are out there, you know, where it's got a mechanical groove and you uh, hook it up together. Um, again, uh, you want to make sure you don't have it over rusted and you want, you, you want to improve your life. It's just something you still got to remember to do. Right. Uh, checklist is great here. Um, again, I mean, you guys are operating, I mean, your days are, your hours maybe five grand, 10 grand, 20 grand per hour, uh, millions per day. And, and if this is the uh, life of your plant, you, you might as well uh, take care of it. Yeah, most plants will have a grease guy, you know. <laughs> yeah, grease guy. And the main thing is on the grease guy, just make sure uh, you got the right amount. Right. Okay. So overall on the lubrication, I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on it. We do have uh, some upcoming lubrication specific webinars in the next couple weeks. So keep an eye out for it. If you want to know more details, go ahead and email us. We can tell you. So today we're talking about lubrication, tools, and data. Okay, so now we're talking about tools and the measurement principles uh, with the tools. The tools can be a physical tool that you go in and do measurements. The tool could be a way to analyze. The tool could be whatever we think can help you diagnose, diagnose a, an issue, okay? As you guys can see, this is just some of them. This, this doesn't include all of them. This is just some of the measures that are important, and we'll talk about the specific tools that you can use or you can have a service to uh, take those measures. Don't act as alignment. Okay, so circumferential cracks, misalignments, stress on the shell. Is it straight? Is it not? you got different ways to do these measures. We have IKDU 101 that will help you align your unit with a tape measure and some string. And this is a hint. If you guys go to the IKDUs, uh, we use a broom. If you guys uh, want to know more, uh, I'll show you what that is when we come over here when uh, when uh, we uh, we can uh, open up the markets again. Um, or it can be what, what we do is we use total stations, we use different methodologies, we get a very, very tight measurement set so that we can get it in and do the measure, do it accurately, do it with what we need in a day, two days on just the shots, just the total station shots. So again, it can be 
tape measures and some strings, or it could be um, as advanced as what we have with the total stations with one second or half second accuracies. Tire diameter. Okay, so you've got a diameter. So why does that matter? Okay, so okay, um, your tire is 60 inches. Okay, so that's about five feet. 60 inches. From the left side to the right side, like in the picture, from the left side to the right side, you got 59 and a half inches, 59 and three quarters, 59 and, you know, and uh, 0 0.9, you know, and then you got 60 inches. You know, one question is how do you know those numbers, right, uh, with something that's moving, right? So one of the one of the tools we have is our, uh, our Tom Tom measuring wheel that we can measure something while it's running, or when it's down, high tape, wrap it, wrap it, um, you know, just measure it directly. So there's all sorts of ways to do it, and the, and the reason why is if it's wearing that way, there's a, either an alignment related issue or something's off. Right. Okay. Uh, roller shaft deflections. So um, you have a crank. You have a crank at the uh, shell, okay, at the tire, okay. So you got a banana, you got a you got a dog leg. Um, if your unit's running, we have a uh, uh, IDM tool. We talked to, actually about this um, uh, yesterday. We have we had a session on the gear running on one of the measures on that is the IDM sensor. Uh, this this fluctuating loads it will ultimately hurt your, I mean, one of the big reasons tires crack is this. A tire's cracking, rollers um, failing, bearings failing, uh, base is failing, tears failing. You can use the IDM sensor, or if you're cold and you can roll it, you can use a dial indicator. Okay, but we're looking very, very fine, 0.2 millimeters, so um, thousands, thousands, okay? This is just easier, and and you're you're not down, so that's why right. I don't like that measure. And you're collecting data pretty quickly. Yes, uh, in a day you'll get all the all the details. Right. <clears throat> um, ovality. Okay, so you guys know ovality. If it's high, you you uh, the easiest way to think is if it's if it's got nothing on it, it's a perfect circle. And if it's bending back and forth, it's not a perfect circle. When you do that to brick at your house, it'll probably break it. So same thing with the kiln. It's no different. It oscillates back and forth on it's tight and then less tight, tight and less tight. Excuse me. And um, overall, when it starts to get looser and looser, ovality, how oval, how outside of a pure circle it is, you can start seeing the differences. We uh, also did uh, detailed discussions on, on um, our ovality sensor. And we even compared it to a uh, old uh, mechanical sensor or right. mechanical beam. That's around here somewhere. Yeah, it's around here somewhere. It's over here. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, why don't we want to go ahead and show that? It's, it's always worth uh, sure. showing that. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this off. I'm gonna turn mine, um, my uh, camera off. We're gonna go, we're gonna show this. If you guys had to see it, this is pretty old school. Let's see here. See that? So can you imagine holding this onto your uh, 800 degree uh, shell? You hold it up. It's pretty, pretty heavy. And then when it comes around, I would not want to be the one trying to take it all out. No. no. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, on that, uh, the, the new tool set we have is about a fourth of the size. It's um, about... It's Bluetooth, so you guys see uh, on that picture on on the uh, over here with with someone put, placing the valley sensor on it. It's about the size of maybe a hand, maybe two hands. So it's much much better. I I, I have put the valley beam on, and I have seen people put the valley beam on, and they were beat red uh, by the time they got it, and I that sucks. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Shell profile, so this is where if you have a span um, or or you need to figure out if you need to change shell, how much distortion you have, this is a measure that we can do. You can um, 
scrap it out uh, individually with uh, total stations, or um, you can even get a Bosch laser and just sit there and shoot and then watch it oscillate back and forth. The tool set that we have just makes it where it makes our life easier. We don't have to sit there and reinvent the wheel every time. Well, just getting the kind of reports back like this, as you can see, I mean, that that's that's huge. Right. I mean, can you imagine sitting there recording your little Bosch right. laser? The technology of the tools has, has made life a lot easier for us. Yes, yes. And then these, um, a, lot of, a lot of you guys that work with your drive systems, ways to couple the, the um, couplers and align them. You got shaft hogs, fiber lines. You can use a dial indicator. I mean, whatever whatever makes that align the best way you can on your gear coupling systems, feel free to, to explore all that. Again, these are all uh, measures, tools that you can use to, to improve your life. Some non-destructive testing. Um, so things you could do is um, looking for cracks, okay? So uh, if you think there's an internal crack on your tire, on your rollers, on your shafts, this is a way to do that, okay? Make sure if you do do the um, rollers and the, and the tires to look for something that uses an angle probe because um, if you don't and there is still a crack, you may miss it with some of the straight probes. So we got over some tools. Um, what do you do with the data, right? So you start with why, okay? So we, we got a ton of tools. There's a ton of technology. People are really good at making good tools uh, to where it, it measures data well. But the tool user or the person um, say asking us to go out and do a service, it's important to know why you're doing it, why right. why you need to do it, right? So like when we do a kiln access survey or a DAT scan, our idea here is how do we use data to get um, information on why you should or shouldn't make a repair? If you can justify to your capital group or to your management group, or if you're the management group, um, justify to yourself that it matters and the data shows it. And this is where um, <clears throat> you can use the data um, to, do some, to, to do your budgets and your shutdowns. If you see that the creep is half inch per rev and three quarters of an inch per rev and one inch per rev, this um, over the course of say three or four years, and then you see that, okay, it's one inch per rev now. From last year until this year, it, it changed about eight inch, okay? Um, from our data, right, so our meeting the plant now, uh, it was about uh, two years before we got to one and a half, and that's when we start seeing issues. Okay, cool. Hey, IKD, we're about an inch. Um, we got roughly a year. So we will plan the 18 month shutdown from now to do a pad replacement because we think we'll hit about 1.5 pre at that point. And uh, will you go ahead and start the process? Because if we can plan it, we can, if we can get the right resources in place, then ultimately it'll be a lot cheaper. Yeah, well, you're, it's preventative maintenance plus two. The more important part of that is, is you're trending the information. Yes, so that's where you can use data. So again, <laughs> and it's great to have data, it's great to trend data, but again, if you don't know where your data is, if you don't use the data, typically you won't you won't use it. So that's where what we do is we try to actually trend your data when we do do yearly uh, services or or like the Kodak survey. If we do more than once, we try to see okay from this year to this year, what does it look like? Right. Or the oil analysis. So one of the things we're we're trying to see, trying to do now is how to put it all in one spot. So that's something kind of cool that we're we're actively working on in the background. So what else other than data? So you can do inspections, right? I mean, you guys do it all. Uh, well, other than the tools. Like other than the tools, other than right? The tools, what other? What else can you do to help you get data or trend information? Right, or or uh, get a set of eyes on it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we do a lot of inspections. Mm -hmm. uh, we do uh, basic walkthroughs. I mean, mm -hmm. there's. In a fresh set of eyes on things, bring right. someone in to look at things. So. Uh, that's what I call uh, asking the dumb questions. I always ask dumb questions like, hey, uh, um, you know, this thing is blue. Uh, is that normal? 
plant because uh, uh, when, when, when things get really hot, it gets turned blue. Right, right. Oh, we didn't notice that. Okay, cool. Well, then um, maybe there's something else here, right? So as long as we can help you solve a problem or, even more importantly, actually, identifying the problem or identifying the root cause, uh, what I've learned now is the repair is actually the easy part. And what I mean by that is you know what you can do, you know what you can plan, you know um, the resources, and you can implement it. Right. A lot of times what's hard is what happened? Diagnosing. Diagnosing yeah. it and where's the root cause? Because if we do a repair and then it's not the root cause, we just fixed the, we just ended a symptom. Right. And it may pop back up, pop back up again. Right. So again, uh, we're transitioning now over to data, to why data matters, to why the measurement principles matter. So shell data, um, try not to exceed 750 to 800 degrees Fahrenheit on the shell. Um, and the reason why is you start getting, um, um, you start losing the yield strength of the shell. You start getting into the more fatiguing side of shell. I had a group, we chatted, it's one of the major groups in, um, in uh, um, you know, cement, pulp and paper. It's one of the big uh, um, kiln um, plant uh, producers, not kiln producers, producers that uses kilns. They said that 70% of shell replacements for capital, so I was talking to their capital guy, 70% of the shell replacements were due to overheated tires. And I was like, oh, wow, that is actually, that's, that's pretty high. That's a big number. So if you, if you think, if you got, let's say, 20 plants and 70% of them, uh, and let's say um, 10 of them, 10 of them want a shell, mm -hmm. that's, that's a lot of money that you have to uh, um, plan for from a shell replacement standpoint. That one want to start finding out why. Yes. So <laughs> if I was capital, and I go, well, a shell is how much, like 500000 to a million bucks to change shell, oh, yeah. depending on how long or short it is or if it's got a tire section, and you just ask me for about $7, $10 million worth of shell replacement, and you could have done a, you know, Thirty to sixty thousand um, dollar service just to check, meh. You know, yeah. ROI is pretty bad on, the, or ROI is pretty good on the service, but pretty bad on the right. service, right. Right? right? So, keep it under seven hundred degrees or eight hundred degrees is a is a very very good reason. And if you can't, this is where you start looking at refractory. Why? Or your burner? Why? There's there's a reason. Uh, uh, you you don't just naturally have eight hundred degrees. Right. Right. Longitudinal cracks. So this is where um, this happens more often when you got high valley. And we have high valley typically means your refractory starts to get loose. Um, and if you've let it stay loose a little bit longer, typically uh, the refractory going down will cause you to shut down to uh, fix it. But if you if the refractory is hovering and you let it kind of fluctuate over time, you'll get what we call axial cracks like this. Um, the saving grace of axial cracks is it will stop, okay? Um, what I mean is uh, it'll, it'll crack longitudinally and it'll stop, and then you repair it. Um, so you can survive typically to your next shutdown and then do a, do a major repair. The more consequential, well, and here's, a, here, here's some thoughts on, on that is it loosens and it goes up and down, up and down. This one is where you probably want to shut down. I'd say so. Because uh, this one will also stop, but uh, uh, you may have a, <laughs> not, <laughs> right, right, right. You may have uh, more issues. Right. This one stop. When this one starts to appear, you need to shut down. Okay, and you can't survive to the next shutdown. Um, yeah, and if right. you see uh, like really bright stuff coming out of kiln, the you you should shut down. And it looks like the strong backs are not helping. Right. Just just because you put strong backs on it doesn't mean doesn't mean it fixes things. It just it's a mandate. You can fix the root cause. Okay, so so we talked a little bit about all that. So now data bearings. 
Bearings have a certain life, okay? And these are all different things that the big bearing manufacturers, your Dodgers, your SKFs, your ABDs, um, will will have these types of calculations because they They'll work closely with the lubrication. Group. Right. Um, there's a certain life hour to it. There are certain factors to it. There's loading to it. And uh, uh, there's materials, there's conditions. So there's all sorts of factors in there. One of the interesting things is if you over thrust a bearing, it will typically fail a lot of other bearings. Um, so if you if you increase the thrust on it, your life may go from was it 200,000 hours to a lot less. It's an exponential drop. Okay, so these are where for bearings try to not keep it over skewed. You skew it as as least amount as possible just to get the unit floated. Any kind of misalignment, period. Any kind of misalignment, because your lubrication is there to help while it's aligned, but if it's misaligned, it would just easily move the lubrication out of the way and start metal metal contact. Pinion, gear alignment measures, how to record. So you can check your root clearance. You can put feeler gauges, uh, feeler, feeler gauges in to check your backlash. Um, these are obviously done while it's down. When it's running, this is where you can start taking temperatures, assuming it's big enough. Sometimes it was too small and full of grease. If you got a really thick asphaltic um, grease or uh, oil on your lubrication system, taking temperatures is going to be a little bit harder, okay, because it's just a big old blob. But if it's got like the uh, nice um, synthetics, um, the, the, the thinner lubrications, the synthetics, is where you can try to take some temperature measures. If it's within, let's say, five degrees, with it's very, very consistent. It's not like one is 120 and the other is 140. Right. Then it, I would say, hey, you know, your temperature's okay. So these are some of the uh, ideas and concepts that you can work with to get it. Gear data, there's lots of details on gears. Um, how you cut the gear, the resistance on the design of the gear. On the gears, we will have specific things uh, on gears, on girth gears coming up. So we'll have some guys that are quite familiar with the gears, quite familiar with the details of designing a gear that can go through the, the calculations here. Um, or just discussions on what, what may or may not cause it. Cause Really, this is not not a not a hard calculation. It's just a long one because you have to track down each variable, find what it is, verify what it is, put the number in, and then cal and then put it all together. Um, there's no uh, fancy uh, calculus on it, numerical method on it. This one's actually pretty straightforward, plug and chug. The issue is what's the plug? How do you add something in there and it makes sense? Uh, this is where uh, our engineers here are, are very um, well versed along with the experience that we got with our with our team. Would you say there's a standard um, for, for gear material? The gear material um, is not really, I mean, you have your typical ones that we use, like your, your different steels, um, but in terms of designing it, there's certain, there's certain types, and it's dependent on the rating that you end up. So if you have a certain rating bandwidth that you want, like, hey, I want to, X amount of PSI, um, then you design the material to it. But typically, you design the the, the size to it, okay. and then go from there. Gotcha. Yeah. But yeah, it is uh, one of the more interesting pieces. Woo! I feel good. I actually uh, went through. Uh, we we did we didn't we didn't stand on too many topics too long. No, oh no, we we <laughs> went a little bit faster this time. Right, right. Um, if you guys got any questions. I don't even mind having having a little bit little bit better uh, question discussion this time on it because the last time I remember we were running out of time before we uh, we moved a little past this time right so lubrication tools data lubrication is main point here is you want high viscosity okay um, how much viscosity talk to your lubrication guys but um, the idea is viscosity think of Honey versus water. Honey is thicker, okay? That thickness will ultimately create a film. That film is what's between what, Mike? When you put it between two pieces of 
Well, I mean, you get you're getting, I guess, what friction and right. So you ultimately got a metal metal. You you got the layer in between, and that layer in between is your lubrication. So you can not have the layer in between and have metal metal contact, but this is what protects it. Right. So yeah. So between the, yes, between the two pieces. Correct. Right. Right. The lubrication. But. Right. Mm -hmm. So when um, when you do that and it's got a good layer, it has good protection. The thinner it is, if you use water to lubricate versus honey versus oil versus whatever, we've done some tests and uh, some of them work well, some of them don't. Um, the speed matters on it, the, the weight matters on it. So this is why it's not so straightforward in terms of the uh, using a, a type of lubrication. Right. <laughs> There's a push for you, Mike. Oh, I <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm looking through the questions, guys. Uh, how do you get rid of grease termites? Well, I'm going to have to call Ralph up and talk to him a little bit because apparently he's got some grease termite problems. We'll call, we'll call an exterminator for him. I appreciate the question, Ralph. <laughs> Um, some of you guys uh, uh, have the handouts not loading. We can uh, directly send those later. So another question is, how do you determine how much graphite is right on the tire? Let's see here. Tire lubrication between it and the roller. Well, um, it's got a that what what do you call that dull? It's a film. It's it's just it's hard to explain, but yeah, it's just you've got that film between between it from the from the graphite. I mean, as long as I guess if you what we typically do when we walk up, we have a glove on if the unit's down, we mm -hmm. kind of take our finger across it. We can see any kind of residue uh, of film on there. But what could happen possibly too is the stuff starts glazing over. Yes. So it's uh, I don't know. If, you may be better to answer the question of how much is too much or not. Right. Oh, so this is a visual. So if you got a tire and that tire is um, is uh, um, rolling and it's perfectly shiny, that effectively means there's nothing on it. Okay. So when you have a very shiny tire, that typically means your graphite is glazed over or your graphite block is glazed over. And when it's glazed over, you need to scuff it up and then place it back on. So when you look at the tire and it's shiny and then you have the right lubrication on it, it's going to look like it's dulled a little bit, a little bit duller. So then if you run your hands through it, you'll actually have real fine graphite all over it. Right. It looks like you got another question there. I have seen – so there's another question. Is um, this gentleman seen um, – bars that could be placed between the tire and the shell. Would you lubricate recommend the idea of the tire? To lubricate the idea of the tire. Um, so yeah, so you do have uh, the bars and these bars are typically made of graphite and some uh, other materials. You, or uh, some, some of the groups is used blocks in between also. Well, one of the things too that we need to look at uh, we're dealing with or working with uh, Whitmore, mm -hmm. and there is a actual spray yes. that you can use that you can put into a, uh, it's a uh, ratio mix between water and graphite. Right. That you can actually put into like your standard uh, sprayer that you can right. get like a tractor supply or somewhere like that. that you can put in there and you can actually coat mm -hmm. the shell and the inside of the tire as the unit's rotating. Right. And that can be done once every couple of weeks. Right. Like that. Right. And a lot safer too. Right. Um, so <laughs> the is, uh, just put some blocks in between the, the tire and the and the and the um, shell in between. So over time it'll kind of wear off a little bit and then get between the tire and the tire pad. That's one. Um, you have to spray and you have um, the bars that will melt. Some okay. Chocolate, they're called I think chocolate bars. Chocolate bars. Um, those are ways that you can get some lubrication in the middle. So I think I think the bars, if you don't do anything and just let it sit there, that will help. But right. uh, you'll run into the uh, uh, glazing phenomenon too. One of the uh, main reasons uh, some of the groups will use sprays uh, uh, in a pinch is if you don't creep, 
in the kiln, in a, in a high temp kiln. Now, we are actually working with Whitmore on, on some ways to look, re-look at graphite blocks, re-look at what that is, and, and, we, and we're investigating some products that, that can actually not glaze, which, which we like. So these are things that, again, we have some uh, lubrication-specific uh, uh, webinars coming up that can go through in more detail. And we actually started talking about the thought I saw in the email blast that's coming out on the bars that are coming out. Right, right, right. So, so keep um, keep us in mind that will that that will happen soon. Okay. Uh, any other questions, Mike? I think uh, we're still doing pretty good on time. Yeah. No. I mean, um, we've talked a little bit about trending the information. I think <clears throat> we've had a lot of requests for uh, preventative maintenance type yes. uh, plans and layouts and things like that. And yes. I think. Uh, to me, just about anything that you can kind of come up with, I mean, uh, is going to be helpful. Temperatures, right. Right. You know, things like that that you're walking around and checking on a, on a regular basis. And, you know, you get asked all the time, you know, how often should you check this stuff? And to me, you check it. If you're having an issue, for sure, it's, that should be something that you put towards the front. But if, you know, if you've got a machine that's running and it's running pretty good, you know, you can go to a weekly check. Um, it just it really depends on the unit mm -hmm. and, and the issues that you may or may not be seeing. But, but it, to me, anything that, that you have on a machine that's rotating should be checked, you know, on right. a regular basis. Right. And in terms of the trending, like I said, right now, one of the, one of the things I really want to get going on is a, a, a way to hold all the reports and the data. Okay. So we're actively working on a way to where, um, if we do a service for you, we'll have that at one spot. If we do a, say, an oil analysis for you, we'll have that at one spot. If we do a kiln access survey, we'll do that at one spot or a dash can. And, and the data is now what we're going to use to kind of drive a lot of things forward. Right, right. That's going to be really neat because if you see that, we, we are moving from firefighting to more preventative to eventually, I would love to see all of our all, all the people we work with doing predictive, hey, you know, uh, this is coming up. I think we, we need to go ahead and start doing this once you put us on the schedule and get it done. Well, when you have the data, you have the facts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's no longer speculation. I mean, you right. Know, so it's no longer an opinion. Right. Because um, if, if we're sitting here and then Mike's like, well, we got, I, got a, I got this opinion, and then I go, I got this opinion, and you're going to be like, uh, okay, and it doesn't match. To your point, data driven. Data driven. Yeah, so uh, if, if if Mike and I are sitting here arguing with you that one plus two is uh, not three, then uh, uh, I think we have an issue, right? Right. <laughs> but if we're like, hey, I know it's three, and he knows it's three. How you got the three? I don't know how you got the three. I don't know how you did one plus two or one point five plus one point five. I don't know how, but we want three. <laughs> well, and it goes back to the tooling too to help us get to this information. Right. And, you know, I agree with you one hundred percent. It should be data driven. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, uh, it looks like we have another question. It says, uh, if I have no creep, should I use a spray or a bar to lubricate between the tire and the pads? If it's a kiln and you normally have creep, yes, you want to uh, you want to put some uh, um, lubricate. Uh, you want to you want to lube in between. If you typically, if it's not creeping, you leave it alone, and you and and we and we try to figure out what it is. So in a normal kiln with a floating tire pad design between the tire, you know, it's, it's typical and you're normally creeping and you're looking at say half inch per rev, quarter inch per rev creep. And now all of a sudden you're not creeping. Two things you need to do. One is go ahead and get it to creep. Okay. Because if it's not creeping, you are now locking the tire to the, to the pads. Okay. And what that normally means is something got too hot, so the shell kind of expands to where it it it, it gets stuck. And if you uh, on I think session one, I talked about creep and how if you don't, if uh, it's Mike and I running, we're gonna run around a, a, a circle or around a, a track. If I'm on the inside, Mike's on the outside. I'm gonna ultimately win. Okay, if we run at the same speed. If you are locked, if you have no creep, Mike and I are handcuffed. Eventually, something's going to give. Right. So if you have no creep and it is a standard kiln, you know, 
open paper kiln, lime kiln, uh, cement kiln, you know, large kiln with a floating pad design, and it doesn't creep, you need to A, figure out why it's not creeping, and B, go ahead and lubricate it to get it creep. Or if it was a dryer. The dryer, it kind of depends, right? So on a dryer, some of them are designed not to creep uh, because the temperature is not so big of an issue. Um, um, we actually did do an FEA on, on a dryer and saw the difference in if that shell expands a little bit, however little it was, to something else, what the stresses were. We're talking it was like 200 degrees. It was really small, and we, we saw that they were at the limit. They were okay, but they were at the limit on the stresses that we allow. So, yeah, on a dryer, it, it um, you normally want it to creep if you have a design where your paths are meant to be changed. If your paths are not meant to be changed, or let's say you have a um, design where um, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't allow it, then, then creep, you want to try to get it as low as possible. Because the more it creeps, the more the tire and the pads see each other and the more wear you get. The more, the less creep you have, the less movement you have, the less wear you have. The issue when it's low creep is, like I said, temperature of the shell, maybe too much to where you have less than zero creep where it gets stuck. Now you have deformation problems. Right. But if you uh, have it as low as possible, the perfect, perfect scenario is 0.001 inch per round creep. Okay? But that's not practical. No. <laughs> so quarter inch, half inch in that range is tends to be good. Um, okay. Any other question? So, um, oh, okay. So, yeah, it, for, for, um, for dryers, if it doesn't creep, I would actually see if that pad design is, is such that it doesn't creep. Because sometimes on the dryers, I know a lot of the frac sands, some of them will have a, um, it's one of the spring plate type of units that will have a weird design on it where it may or may not creep. Some of them put an anti-rotation block on it to prevent creep. So, and what we've seen now is the anti-rotation blocks will eventually wear out. We, I don't think we, it's something we recommend, though. Is right. right. No, it's typically you want to pad that moves around. Yeah. You, want, you want some kind of creep. You want some kind of creep. Okay, well, if you guys got any deeper questions, if you guys got any um, other concerns, feel free to send us an email um, at... Uh, Contact at industrialkiln.com. We're essential business. We're open. We're we're here, ready to help. Okay. Absolutely. So um, I think I think uh, we're we're starting to see some better activity coming up. So again, we appreciate the time. We appreciate. Uh, I mean, I mean, if you guys made it this part of the webinar four, I hate man, but right, right. Like, we've had some loyal followers. We got some loyal followers. We got some loyal followers. It's because I mean, Mike Mike got a good hat. Well, yeah, that's yeah. You know. <laughs> Look, we got we to gotta give a shout-out to Ralph. He's been watching. So. <laughs> Man, I love it. Termite, termite, uh, termite grease out. <laughs> we appreciate you, Ralph. <laughs> we appreciate you. All right, guys. Uh, thank you, and uh, have a good day, night, afternoon, wherever you're at. Stay safe, stay sane. Peace out, guys. Stay healthy. Bye.